Hello, and welcome to episode 5 of the Printicast for this rather cold October 6th, 2012. Oh yes, there's people here. I'm Chris. <laughs> and I'm Grover. I'm Mike. And welcome to the show. Before we get into our topic of the day, which is storytelling and video games, we're first going to mention what we've been up to this week. So, how about you, Grover? I have been, yet again, playing another week of Space Alien Zombies. <laughs> the game has taken over my life. That's bad. Yes. Mm -hmm. And that's pretty much it? That is pretty much it. I have added mods to the game now, so that just brings more to the game, and... I have a couple more achievements I'm trying to finish off, and then I think that will be the end of that game. And then on to the next one. On to the next. So how about you, Mike? Oh, it's mostly World of Warcraft again. Uh, I don't think I've actually played any other game besides that, not even on my phone. But I did get a lot of uh, DVD watching done while I was playing <laughs> home movies and stuff like that. Or the stuff that I've already seen before that I could just leave home running in the background. Home movies the show, not home movies. Right, show. right. I love that cartoon. So good. <laughs> So what have you been up to? A uh, little bit of Minecraft, a little bit of WoW, a little bit of Spaz, a little bit of Dogfight 1942, which I don't have video of it presently because I can only full screen the thing and my recorder doesn't like full screening very well as you might have noticed with my attempt to take video of Richard a couple of years <laughs> back. And I've also been playing some congregate games like Deep Sleep and Sun Machine 8 and Legend of Pandora and a very interesting game called Vorp, which is kind of like a combination of League of Legends and Spaz. Your spaceships, with all the spaceship mechanics you're used to in those top-down kind of go-anywhere games, but the idea of the game is you pick a character and you battle to destroy each other's main bases, the whole turrets and everything. So it's, it's definitely a League of Legends MOBA Dota knockoff, but it was actually kind of entertaining. I can't play it too much because of my internet problems, but <laughs> I, I played a few of the, the practice rounds, which are... Don't exactly give you anything more than the enemy drones to face, but it was still a, an experience that it, at least I can have the video to be showing you guys here. So that being said, on to game news. And not a lot has really happened. There's been a lot of little things, so this is probably going to be a little more of a boring run-through with stuff that everybody probably already knows at this point. Like the free Mass Effect DLC that's going out almost the time this goes up. It's uh, on the 9th, I believe, so it'll be Tuesday. You've got the Riot Games Season 2 World Final Playoffs of League of Legends, which is, has a $2 million champion's purse. So they've got teams from all over the world competing, and sometime this evening, Saturday, will be the conclusion of that. So at least you don't have me giving you spoilers of who won yet. I probably will not be bothering with Kotaku too much longer because they are such a one of those sensationalist magazines. I remember back in the day they were one of the places to get news from. With one or two exceptions of anything newsworthy, all week long it's been drivel. I've been getting almost all of my news from everybody else, and they aren't covering any of it. So, I don't know what's up there. I mean, I've not been a Kotaku follower for a long time, but every time I heard about game news, people were constantly quoting it. So it's a little strange for me to finally be doing it myself and not find anything worthwhile. I didn't really read a whole lot of Kotaku. It was mostly just like what you said. People would quote Kotaku, so I would look it up and be like, sure enough, there it is. But I didn't ever really view them as a you know current news source. It was more like what you said, kind of sensationalist. It's more of a coffee magazine. I mean, coffee. Yeah. Coffee uh, table magazine, though. There you go, yeah. Which, I guess there's room for that. That's true. No, doesn't help me a whole lot. <laughs> now, probably the biggest news for this week is Cliffy B, Cliff Lisinski of Epic, has left his long-standing position there. So he joins in uh, Daniel Erickson, who left Bioware earlier, and, of course, the, the Bioware creators themselves, who left not too long ago. Among many, many others, this is seeming to be a trend, and it's not just that these guys are, well, not everybody, but it's not that these guys are just leaving their companies. They're leaving the business entirely. They're going on to do other things. So I'm kind of wondering if this trend is because of how games have become such a commercial thing. The creativity process is being trumped by industry. That would be my suspicion. It doesn't seem like companies like that are really allowed to do the things that they want to do and be successful. It's like you, you have to pretty much make the generic shooter for your fans to be happy. They really don't want something innovative and new and different. They all say they do. 
Uh, it's like, I think we talked about this the week before. They just really don't want something so new that it takes them out of their comfort zone. They want to be in that, I know what I'm doing already, and so I'm going to be awesome at this game and get online immediately and kill everybody in sight. And there's a lot of franchises, I think, are keeping people a little closer to them than they used to because it used to be more of a fan base around companies. It seems to be pulling closer and closer to fan base around specific games. I, I would have to agree. I will say, though, a lot of people that like World of Warcraft and Starcraft and Diablo play at least one of the other ones, if not all three. I think Blizzard and Valve are both companies that Bioware did. I'm not so sure anymore, but uh, they still kind of keep the company fan base. I think so. There's not so many of everybody else anymore. But speaking of fan bases, PS3 owners are not very happy about this whole thing with Skyrim. Dawn Guard has been released for quite a while now, and the PS3's version still hasn't been fixed, I guess is the term for it. And Skyrim Heartfire is now set to release for the PC and 360. So this is going to be two expansions that the PS3 is going to be missing out on, and for who knows how much longer. It's a conundrum! I think that's going to hurt both Bethesda and Sony in the long run. And Bethesda's put it all on them. They're not blaming the the network. They're not blaming Sony for any of it. It's nothing to do with the system. It's bugs within their side of it that isn't worked out quite right. And it's going to only affect a certain percentage, which is kind of interesting when you talk about... I don't remember if I mentioned it on the show or not, but uh, there's a indie game called Fez that had an update that ruined people's uh, save files. And I remember that. And it fixed a whole bunch of other bugs, and some people were absolutely happy with it, and others weren't. And that's never been fixed as far as I know. I've even heard rumor that it will never be fixed, that they're leaving it that way. And so this is kind of the opposite direction. They're refusing to release it until all of those potential bugs that might erase game saves and who knows what else is fixed. I think Bethesda is fairly widely known for its bugs. So something as large as what it sounds like it is would really put them even more on the mark for that. And they probably... I don't know what would do more damage, though. Having a few more bugs or not ever getting the content. I think they should just release it, even with the bugs. The fans will get over it. They, they're, I mean, they're obviously showing they want it. Even if it's going to be buggy, they still want to play. I mean, yeah, that's... Just call it a beta, just like everybody else does. Just release it as a beta. <laughs> And that's a perfect segue into Final Fantasy XIV. They're expecting to reopen its alpha sometime this month. And it's under the subtitle of Realm Reborn. We'll see if this means a comeback for Final Fantasy XIV and pull out of its really awful start, or if it's too little too late. Because it's been a year now, and any wildfire Final Fantasy XIV might have had is long gone. I didn't even yeah. know I, it had only been a year. It seemed like it has been longer. Oh, what's 2010? Yeah, it's been a while. So it has been two years. Yeah, I think all the hype has pretty much left that game. You know, they should have just they should have just called it Final Fantasy 14 too, because I don't maybe maybe even called it Final Fantasy 15 or something. I mean, I hope that it's a lot better. Maybe they'll get lucky and it's it's not going to have the same success that it would have had if they did this in the first place and not had the original version. Mm-hmm. But I hope they they get a decent amount of people so it doesn't just die. The score's been kind of hurting the last couple of years, and I know Final Fantasy XIV was no small part about that. It was Final Fantasy XIII. Uh, did did I, not like thirteen. <laughs> I didn't like thirteen at all. It was pretty... It was good as far as graphics, but that was about all it had going for it. I, I, I did like some of the characters but I didn't really get far enough to get invested into it because I couldn't stand the gameplay. And again, another interesting segue. As we all know, Hasbro's been shelling out a lot of its properties for movies lately with uh, G.I. Joe and Transformers and more recently Battleship. And actually, the G.I. Joe movie keeps getting postponed. It was supposed to have been out by now, and I'm hearing dates of summer of next year. Because of some of their other acquisitions, and they've uh, tied these up with the makers of End of Watch and uh, Rambo, Conan, and Mechanic movies, the remakes of Rambo and Conan. Well, I don't... Rambo 4. Blah! Um, they have acquired the rights to a Action Man movie, a Monopoly movie, and the Hungry Hungry Hippo movie. <laughs> Oh uh, what? <laughs> I'm hungry, hungry, hungry hippo. <laughs> Maybe it's a CGI comedy. I don't know, but I cannot picture how they're going to make a movie about <laughs> giant hippos <laughs> eating giant marbles. They're gonna go hunting for hippos with marbles. <laughs> 
or the marbles are an alien invasion. <laughs> That's like the, the hippos to save everyone. Oh man, I could see a battleship movie. I cannot see a hungry, hungry hippo movie. I'm sorry. There's just no way. <laughs> I think that movie would be as good as the Speed Racer movie. I actually like the Speed Racer movie. It could have been worse, yes. Yeah. It's not entirely new news, because this has been talked about for months now. But it's actually been finally happening over the last week. Steam has been offering non-gaming software on their site. So things like Art Rage Studio Pro and 3D Mark and 3D Coat, Camera Bag 2, and uh, I believe just yesterday, which was the 5th, I think Game Maker Studio came out. Complete with achievements for Steam for some reason. So... <laughs> This is an introduction of something Steam's been wanting to do for a while, is opening their whole gaming system into new realms that are still related to gaming. And I don't know, maybe this is the start of integrating these programs so they can communicate with each other instantaneously through the network. So you can make something and say, one of the 3D programs, shift it over to the art program, then shift it over to the Game Maker program. It's not happening yet, mind you, but I'm kind of wondering if this isn't something they're trying to get uh, the gaming industry interested into, so that something like that could happen. Just a thought. Pause. <laughs> Just a second. <laughs> Hang on, she pooped. Okay. I have to pick it up. <laughs> Ew!